So from Harry's point of view, the troll's scent is described as, quote, a mixture of old socks and the kind of public toilet no one seems to clean. Dang, Harry, you have an oddly specific sniffer. I knew the Dursleys used to beat you a lot, but did they really leave you alone in public toilets to the extent you could instantly recognize the smell? Spoiler warning, this is an in-depth retrospective and story analysis of the entirety of the Harry Potter books, one chapter at a time. If this is your first video in the series, it is highly recommended that you begin watching this series from the beginning, which you can do by going to the playlist that I provide right here. Okay, now that everyone is all caught up, let's continue. So as Harry and Ron contemplate their discovery of the three-headed dog, they try to consider what it might be guarding. Harry is quick to connect the dots and realizes that the small thing Hagrid took from Gringotts is what the dog was guarding, but without any additional clues, they can't really have a serious guess at it. For this chapter, we won't actually get an extra clue as to what the item is, as this chapter's primary contributions to the main plot are A. Learning the rules of Quidditch, and B. Having Hermione become Harry and Ron's friend. However, in the meantime, Harry and Ron were hoping for a way of getting back at Malfoy, since, as I explained in the last chapter, the teachers are going to do fuck all to get Malfoy to stop bullying them. Yeah, he was surprised to see Harry and Ron still at Hogwarts, but that only means his bullying didn't work, not that it actively backfired. Well, at breakfast a week after the Remember All incident, Harry gets his own broom in the mail. There's a letter attached to it telling Harry not to open it in the Great Hall so as to not make everyone else jealous. Honestly, if McGonagall was worried about that, why didn't she just visit Harry in his dormitory and give it to him her own damn self? It's a Nimbus 2000, which, as we heard in a throwaway line from Chapter 5, is the fastest broom ever. I would like to imagine that because it is the fastest ever, that also means it is the most expensive ever. This begs the question of why Dumbledore would sign off on splurging so much. It's one thing that the school goes out of its way to buy Harry his own broomstick, just so he can be on the Quidditch team a year before he would otherwise be allowed. But when discussing his being on the team last chapter, Oliver Wood stated that a Clean Sweep 7 would also be a suitable model. We'll later learn during Order of the Phoenix that the Clean Sweep 7 is a model of broom that is cheap enough for the Weasley family, whose primary shtick is being poor, to be able to afford albeit as a special gift, but still they're able to do it. I can't imagine Professor McGonagall herself paid for the Nimbus 2000, since we'll learn in Half-Blood Prince that teachers at Hogwarts get paid in peanuts. So how is it that Harry was given such extravagance? So as we're taking the broom out of the Great Hall, Malfoy snatches the broom from Harry, because that's what Malfoy fucking does. He takes shit that doesn't belong to him without asking first, because nobody's gonna fucking stop him. He feels inside the package and realizes it's a broomstick and thinks he has yet another chance to get Harry punished. However, Flitwick comes along, hears that it's a broomstick, and now finally, finally, by God, finally, Malfoy gets some fucking comeuppance when Harry explains that it was thanks to Malfoy's bullying bullshit that Harry got the broomstick. Now, and only now, does Malfoy finally start to realize that his constant attempts to get Harry punished not only aren't working, but are actively achieving the complete opposite result he was going for. So for the next few chapters, he's going to be laying off the bullying for a little while before switching tactics a little bit. 
verbally goading Harry, Ron, and Hermione into attacking him, while his physical bullying is directed towards Neville, who sadly does have the sort of spineless personality that makes him a prime target for bullying. Now, all of that being said, I will stand by what I said in the last chapter, that Malfoy should have been punished for his bullying. Sure, it's thanks to Malfoy's bullying that Harry got his spot on the Gryffindor Quidditch team, which is indeed a significant contribution to the series, but I see no reason why we couldn't have had both. Put Malfoy in detention and reward Harry for doing the right thing and standing up to Malfoy's bullying. Those two things aren't mutually exclusive, you know. Give Malfoy a double dose of comeuppance. Sadly, it will take at least a few books before the teachers at Hogwarts actually start punishing Malfoy for his bullshit. Meanwhile, Hermione says that Harry's broomstick is a reward for breaking rules. I wholeheartedly disagree. I consider it a reward for standing up to a bully. It's only because McGonagall, bitch that she was, refused to hear the Gryffindor's side of the story that Harry's actions were treated as a breaking rules. So later that evening, Harry takes his new broomstick out to the Quidditch pitch. Oliver Wood joins Harry and teaches us, the audience, the rules of Quidditch. Now, Harry acts like he's learning the rules of Quidditch himself, but he really isn't if you think about it. Back in Chapter 6, when Harry meets Ron for the first time, there's a brief excerpt where Ron tries to explain the rules of Quidditch. So while we, the audience, didn't read any of Ron's explanation about the rules or positions, it seems rather weird that Harry wouldn't know how Quidditch works. Quidditch is one of the most universally criticized parts of this entire franchise, and for good reason. Most rules of the game are fairly box standard. There's three chasers and a keeper who handle the quaffle, the main ball. That seems pretty box standard, honestly. Then there are two cannonballs called bludgers, with two beaters on each team who deal with the bludgers. That seems pretty barbaric, but it definitely gives the game a medieval feel. In terms of the danger factor they add to the game, it's definitely barbaric, but that's not what most people complain about when it comes to Quidditch being a shit sport. No, it's the Golden Snitch and the position of Seeker that tends to get on everyone's nerves. In Chapter 7, I defended the housing system, but I honestly cannot defend the Snitch and Seeker here, at least not from an in-universe standpoint. What can I say about this ball in position that hasn't already been said a thousand times before? This is certainly one of those plot devices I mentioned in Chapter 7 that is there purely to serve a narrative function, while J.K. Rowling did not consider the in-universe logic whatsoever. The fact that the Snitch is worth 15 goals alone makes the Snitch way too OP to be interesting from a spectator's point of view. I mean, seriously, 15 goals? That's just excessive. But when you add on top of that, the fact that the snitch not only ends the game, but is the only way to end the game, and that the game otherwise has no time limit, and there's no two ways about it. The other six positions in the game are rendered almost completely redundant to the outcome of the game. Now, in the real-life copy of Quidditch Through the Ages, J.K. Rowling makes some token attempt to provide some in-universe justification for the snitch being worth 150 points. Long ago, there used to be a magical bird called the Golden Snidgette. People often liked to catch the Snidget because doing so was supposed to be super hard. However, Quidditch and Snidget catching used to be two completely separate sports. Or rather, Quidditch used to be a sport while Snidget catching was more of a hobby. That was until one fateful day when somebody brought a Golden Snidget to a Quidditch game and offered a prize of 150 galleons to whoever caught the damn thing. 
prompting all Quidditch players to abandon the game entirely in favor of trying to catch the Snidget. Since then, Snidgets and later Balls called the Golden Snitch after the Golden Snidget became an endangered species, have become a part of the game, starting a tradition but eventually becoming a formalized part of the game. The fact that the Golden Snitch, as opposed to the Snidget, is worth 150 points is a testament to the original 150 Galleon prize that was offered. Okay, I suppose that's a fair enough in-universe contextualization. It would have been nice if that context was offered in the main series, but better late than never. However, even to this day, in the year 2020, we still do not have any in-universe justification for the rule that catching the Golden Snitch is the only way to end the game. Honestly, that's the more destructive of the two rules. Even if the Snitch did score any points at all, the Seeker could simply hold off on catching the Snitch until the moment to do so was right. The outcome of the game would still be ultimately determined by the Seekers and their willingness to keep the game going. And to this day, J.K. Rowling hasn't even attempted to give any in-universe justification for such a bogus rule of the game. Even if we look at this purely from a narrative point of view, the Golden Snitch is still very difficult, although not impossible, to justify. The generally accepted version of events is that J.K. Rowling created the position of Seeker and put Harry in that position so that Harry could win games for his team single-handedly. Even if the other players on the Gryffindor team were complete shit, Harry's performance alone can cause Gryffindor to win. For example, in Chamber of Secrets, when Gryffindor faces Slytherin, Harry hears that Slytherin is up 60-10 because of their superior broomsticks. But Gryffindor still wins simply because Harry catches the snitch. In Order of the Phoenix, the narrator even outright states that Ron's abysmal goalkeeping didn't matter, all that mattered was that Harry caught the snitch. This is the Golden Snitch's primary narrative purpose, to enable Harry to win games all by himself. However, that narrative purpose is not worth the entire rest of the game being rendered completely redundant. And more importantly, the narrative purpose didn't even require the entire rest of the game being rendered completely redundant. You want Harry to be able to win games for his team all by himself? Why not make him Keeper? You could write it so that he's so good at goalkeeping that it's nigh on impossible for the other team to ever score, because no matter what kind of zigzagging or fakeouts the chaser might try to can do to confuse Harry, even if you knock two bludgers at him at the same time and force him to contort his body in ways the human body wasn't meant to be twisted in order to dodge both at once, he would still find a way to stop the Quaffle from going through the goalposts. The other team would practically have to hit two bludgers towards Harry, have the chaser zigzag and fake Harry out, and have the game be played during a torrential downpour just to have a 50-50 shot at getting the Quaffle past him. This would enable Harry to win games all by himself, but wouldn't cause all other positions on the team, except the one the franchise's title character happens to play as, be rendered completely irrelevant to the rest of the game. However, all of that being said, I will attempt to defend the Golden Snitch on at least one level. This isn't an in-universe justification, but it is a narrative one. In Deathly Hallows, in Albus Dumbledore's will, Harry inherits the first Golden Snitch he ever caught. The Snitch has the Resurrection Stone inside of it, and only Harry can get the stone out. Why? Because the Snitch only responds to Harry's touch. Why is that? Because Golden Snitches are enchanted to have flesh memories. The wizard who manufactures the Snitch typically wears gloves 
when he does so, and so the seeker who catches the snitch is the first person to ever touch it. This enables the Quidditch referee to determine who actually caught the snitch in the event of a disputed capture. For the snitch that Harry inherits, it responds to Harry's lips. Why? Because Harry didn't catch the first golden snitch with his hands, but rather nearly swallowed it. This is an important plot device in Deathly Hallows, because if the snitch had fully reacted to Harry's hand, the message I open at the close would have appeared on the snitch right in front of Rufus Scrimger, and then he would have been asking a lot of annoying questions. Having the snitch react to Harry's lips provides a convenient excuse to keep that message a secret from Scrimger. So, in order for Harry's inheritance in Deathly Hallows to work, it has to be a ball that A. is enchanted to have flesh memories, so that Harry is the only one who can get the Resurrection Stone out of the Snitch, and B. is small enough to fit inside Harry's mouth, so the flesh memories would be triggered by Harry's lips. This means that it absolutely has to be a Golden Snitch, Neither the Quaffle nor the Bludgers have any excuse to be that size, nor do they have any excuse to be enchanted with flesh memories. While the other narrative purpose can easily be achieved simply by making Harry the Keeper, I honestly cannot conceive an easy workaround for how to handle the Resurrection Stone's concealment. However, I should emphasize that this is purely a narrative justification. In-universe, the Golden Snitch and position of Seeker is still just as nonsensical as it's always been. So after a five-week time skip, we reach Halloween, and more importantly, we get to the lesson on levitation spells. This is important because it marks the first time in the entire series that the instructions on how to perform a spell are explained in detail. Whenever a lesson at Hogwarts is covered in detail, that's usually going to become a plot point later down the line. This is one of the few instances where a spell explained in such detail will get its corresponding payoff later in the very same chapter. In this case, the levitation spell is caused by the incantation Wingardium Leviosa. Because this is the first lesson ever described in such detail, Wingardium Leviosa has become an unofficial mascot for the magical nature of the series, and also how the series uses the excuse of BECAUSE MAGIC as a get out of plot holes free card. For example, in this video from Austin McConnell about Cursed Child, you can see that he uses a play on this incantation as an illustration of how Time Turners are suddenly back in the story despite having previously been written out of the story. Hermione tries to lecture Ron about how to pronounce the incantation. This actually makes me wonder, how exactly do the magic words work? Now, with potions, it makes perfect sense. Many of the things wizards use as ingredients for potions can probably be said to have some innate magical properties. I see potions as essentially the magical equivalent of chemistry. The same could also be said for herbology, it's basically botany, but magic. As such, we can reasonably assume that the laws of potions and herbology would reasonably resemble the real-life laws of chemistry and botany. For example, pharmacists routinely utilize the laws of chemistry in order to predict what effects a certain combination of elements will likely have, and that's how they create new drugs. Potion makers, likewise, can utilize the laws of potions, utilizing the magical properties found in all things on Earth, both living and inanimate, to try and predict new recipes for new potions, or as Snape demonstrates with his Half-Blood Prince textbook, coming up with shortcuts to existing potions to get the same results with less work. But then we have branches of magic such as charms, transfiguration, and defense against the dark arts. I suppose you could also include the dark arts themselves, although that's not taught at Hogwarts for obvious reasons. These branches of magic consist of little more than a witch or wizard performing a specific motion with his wand, calling out a specific incantation, and then stuff happens. 
There is no understanding of the world around them, there's no apparent formula. You just say some stuff and stuff happens. However, this comes with its own set of problems from a world building point of view. See, I would imagine that by saying these incantations, the wizard is causing some law of magic to trigger in a very specific manner. Whenever you say Wingardium Leviosa, for example, magical energy is shooting out of your wand and the first solid object it touches has the appropriate magical property applied to it. But how does the universe itself know that you want to apply the magical property of levitation to the first solid object your magical energy touches? Presumably, the universe has always been capable of applying these magical effects as long as the wizard makes the correct sounds with his mouth. For example, in chemistry, hydrogen and oxygen have always, since the beginning of time, been capable of combining into a 2 to 1 ratio to create water. That's always existed since the Big Bang. So presumably, whenever a witch or wizard makes the sound Wingardium Leviosa with their mouth, then since the beginning of time, that has always had the effect of causing a solid object to levitate. This means that witches and wizards aren't really inventing spells, so much as they are discovering the spells that have already existed since time immemorial. The problem with that logic, however, is that the incantations for spells are not just a random, arbitrary collection of otherwise meaningless sounds. Rather, the incantations actually sound kind of like the effects they are meant to cause. For example, Lumos illuminates the area. Reparo repairs broken items. Expelliarmus expels or gets rid of your opponent's arms. The list goes on and on. Nearly every spell in the entire franchise is based on some wordplay from a variety of dead languages. Languages that once existed in the real world. And this begs the question of how the universe itself would have decided on a random combination of sounds before each magical effect that just so happened to so nicely correspond to the sounds that would, literally billions of years after the Big Bang, be worked into human languages that likewise so nicely correspond to these magical effects. In real life, J.K. Rowling decided on Reparo to be the incantation for the repair spell, because some dead language that existed in real life. But in universe, it was the other way around. In universe, Reparo has always been the sound you need to make with your mouth in order to trigger the repairing magical effect. And yet, that also just happens to correspond to the sound we, as humans, coined to refer to the act of undoing damage inflicted on an object. The only way I could see this working in a way that isn't pure plot convenience is if the incantations aren't etched in stone, but rather trigger some submolecular process inside the wizard's brain that causes the magical effect to happen. Rather than it being the equivalent of a verbal command you give to an automated voice recognition system, a la when you're calling tech support, and are just trying to get through all the automated bullshit before you can speak with an agent. Rather, it's like when you're playing on a slot machine and how all of those bright flashing lights and spinning wheels are designed to stimulate your brain in a very specific, non-obvious way that is intentionally designed to create a psychological dependency on the activity. The incantations for a wizard could work kind of like that. They're brain hacks rather than verbal commands. Hearing yourself say those words might trigger a very specific state of mind, and it's that state of mind, rather than the incantation itself, that causes the magical effect to happen. This would certainly explain why it is so much more difficult to learn how to cast spells non-verbally a skill that is only taught at Hogwarts to any WT level defense against the Dark Arts students. Under this theory, a wizard would have to trigger the appropriate brain hack on command 
without even having the audible stimulus that typically causes the brain hack to happen. And I can totally believe that this is a lot easier said than done. That would be like a casino trying to get you hooked onto gambling without you actually playing the slot machines. However, if we accept this theory of mine, that the spells are caused by a brain hack rather than the incantations themselves, then that still comes with a serious problem. If the idea is to trigger a very specific state of mind, then wouldn't it make more sense if the incantations were said in the language that is most familiar to the witch or wizard performing the spell, in this case modern English? Instead, there is literally only one spell in the entire franchise whose incantation is said in modern English, and that is the Point Me spell that Harry uses in the third Triwizard task that causes his wand to point due north. Literally every other spell in the entire franchise is based on a variety of dead languages that need to have their etymology explained to people, and it just seems weird that those words would trigger a brain hack more efficiently than the caster's native language. So anyway, as the charms lesson progresses, it turns out that everybody is having difficulty getting their feathers to levitate. Since Hermione is a Mary Sue, see my analysis of Chapter 6 for details, she can, of course, make her feather fly on her first attempt without even practicing. She even rolls up her sleeves before doing so, so as to non-verbally say, Watch and learn, you damn simpletons. Clearly, even though she had never done the spell before, she somehow knew she was going to succeed on her first try because she's a Mary Sue. Now, while I consider Hermione's personality in this chapter to be quite obnoxious, I honestly don't mind it for two reasons. First, unlike McGonagall's behavior in the previous chapter, it is definitely being presented with some self-awareness. McGonagall's actions last time were presented as just ordinary teacher behavior, which it sadly was, but as I hopefully made clear last time, the fact that it was standard behavior for teachers was exactly the problem. Here, J.K. Rowling clearly seems to be aware that she's writing Hermione's character to be obnoxious. Second, whereas McGonagall never learns any lessons about the way she treats her students, Hermione's bossy attitude is being set up for a character arc, so I can't excuse Hermione's pompous attitude here. After the lesson, Ron rants about how much Hermione pisses him off, Clearly, these two are going to end up married, I mean, can't you just feel the romance and sexual tension oozing off the page in a very cheery, cheery, cheery sort of way? Hermione hears Ron saying this, and rather than telling him off, bumps into Harry on purpose so Harry can see that she's in tears. Clearly, she realized that Ron was right, and that her bossy and know-it-all attitude was keeping her from making friends. Sure, Hermione puts a lot of value on following rules, as well as her academic studies. We'll eventually learn in Prisoner of Azkaban that when a boggart sees her, it takes the form of Professor McGonagall telling her that she's failed all her exams, meaning that this is her worst fear. Hermione isn't a brainiac per se, so much as she is an attichophobe. Attichophobia being a fear of failure. She puts so much effort into all her classes because her greatest fear is failing at them. However, later in the penultimate chapter of this book, she confesses that she considers friendship to be more important than books or cleverness. So while her fear of failure may motivate her to be top of the class, she now realizes that it's causing her to miss out on the things in life she considers to be truly important. And this realization brings her to tears. When Harry confronts Ron about the fact that Hermione heard him just now, Ron says he doesn't care, or at the very least hopes his little remark will do her some good in a tough love sort of way. Ron points out that Hermione knows he's speaking the truth about her. He claims to not care, 
but the narrator says that Rowan can't even convince himself of his own statement. Honestly, the story has been so good for the past few chapters of having characterization be conveyed directly through the dialogue itself, it's quite painful to see the story go right back to its earlier shtick of simply having the narrator outright tell the audience what characterization we're supposed to take away from the dialogue. I also love how Ron clearly seems to care about how his words make others feel, even though he claims not to care. It really makes me wish he remained as the emotional support of the group, since he's clearly well suited for that role. Sure, his words in this instance hurt Hermione's feelings, but it's precisely because of this harsh truth that she realizes the, well, the harsh truth of the matter. So it ultimately did more good than harm in the long term. In the short term, however, that's a different story. Hermione isn't seen for the entire afternoon of classes. It is later revealed that she has locked herself in one of the girls' bathrooms to cry her eyes out and refuses to talk to anybody. Oh yeah, because that's totally going to help your problem of not having any friends. Because refusing to interact with anybody is a great way to practice your people's skills. The sad part about this is that by the time this chapter wraps up, it will have surprisingly worked. Later that evening at the Halloween feast, everyone is chowing down on food when Professor Quirrell stumbles into the Great Hall, short on breath, saying there's a troll in the dungeons before collapsing in exhaustion. Everyone starts to panic, but Dumbledore takes complete control of the situation, telling the Prefix to lead the students back to the dormitories, while the teachers would accompany him to the dungeons to subdue the troll. However, quite a few fans have pointed out that the Slytherin common room is actually located either in the dungeons or, at the very least, so close to the dungeons that sending the Slytherins to their common room actually puts them directly in harm's way. Clearly, this is yet another part of the series that J.K. Rowling hadn't yet come up with at this point in time. As the Gryffindors are walking back to their dormitory, Ron resumes his role as the Expositor, and explains that trolls are way too stupid to be able to make it into the castle on their own, so somebody must have led the troll in. Harry pulls Ron away from the rest of the Gryffindors when he realizes that Hermione is still in the girl's bathroom and thus didn't get the warning that there was a troll on the loose. Ron doesn't like doing a favor for Hermione, but he realizes that it's the only right thing to do. Once again, Ron's potential as the emotional support shows. However, as they go looking for Hermione, they also notice two things. First, that Snape is headed in the direction of the Forbidden Corridor, instead of to the dungeons where the other teachers and second, the troll is no longer in the dungeons, but is instead wandering the corridors. They get the idea to lock it inside a room, but only realize after it's too late that the room they locked it inside was also the very bathroom that Hermione was holed up in. Oops. Now, I have previously said that I believe Hermione is a Mary Sue, even in the books. The movie simply did a much poorer job of hiding her Mary Sue status. I stand by that assessment, but I will concede that the troll fight is one of the few times when Book Hermione actually comes moderately close to being realistically flawed, as in the books she is too terrified of the troll's presence to fight back or even run away. In the movies, she and Ron each cast simultaneous hovering charms, leaving open the possibility that Ron's spell alone wouldn't have been enough to lift the club into the air. In the books, Ron casts his hovering charm entirely on his own. Harry jumps up and grabs the troll's neck, but it doesn't actually do anything. The closest Harry is able to achieve is causing a distraction by sticking his wand up its nose. But as far as knocking the troll out is concerned, in the books, it is entirely Ron's victory, no one else's. Cool. However, then J.K. Rowling has to go and fuck the moment up. As soon as the teachers arrive, McGonagall starts to blame Harry and Ron. Now, in the movies, McGonagall demands that Harry and Ron explain themselves. But as I've made clear last chapter, 
Book McGonagall doesn't give a fuck about your side of the story. Because Book McGonagall is a bitch. So because Book McGonagall isn't interested in hearing Harry and Ron's side of the story, it's up to Hermione to get them out of trouble. She explains that Harry and Ron were actually rescuing her from the troll, not causing more trouble. However, she also tells McGonagall that she went looking for the troll herself. That's the part I don't get. Hermione absolutely was telling the truth when she said that Harry and Ron were looking for her. She absolutely was telling the truth when she said that if Harry and Ron hadn't found her, she'd probably be dead. Why does she need to lie about going to look for the troll herself? She wasn't breaking any rules just by being in the bathroom. Attendance at the Halloween feast isn't mandatory. If it were, the Golden Trio would have been breaking the rules in Chamber of Secrets just by going to the Death Day party. So no, Hermione was perfectly within her rights by staying in the bathroom, pulling a moaning myrtle on us, and it is only because her being in the bathroom, which she had every right to do, that she didn't know about and therefore was ambushed by the troll. So, why did Hermione need to lie? She could have just as easily have told the unabridged truth, and it would have presented Harry and Ron as heroes all the same. I can honestly only think of one reason Hermione might feel the need to lie about her own recklessness, and that's if she knew McGonagall well enough to know that Harry and Ron's heroism alone wouldn't have been good enough to get them out of trouble. So she had to combine their heroism with her recklessness in order to make Harry and Ron look super extra heroic by comparison. However, if that were the case, that would suggest that J.K. Rowling isn't actually trying unsuccessfully, uh, mind you, but still trying to write McGonagall as the standard fair but strict teacher, but rather instead knows full well that McGonagall is a bitch who doesn't give a damn about Harry and Ron's side of the story. But, I don't know, maybe this entire section is just one great big piece of shitty writing. Oh, but if you think McGonagall was going to escape this section without a verbal pounding from me, you're dead wrong. McGonagall only gives five points each to Harry and Ron, resulting in only a net gain of five points when you take into account Hermione's loss of five points. Unfortunately, there's not much analysis I can give for that section since even the characters call attention to how bullshit that is. Anyway, the chapter ends with the narrator stating that Hermione had become their friend, because apparently knocking out a mountain troll is the sort of experience that builds friendships. Honestly, I don't buy it in this case. I think it was Ron's statement earlier in the day that Hermione's bossy know-it-all attitude was keeping her from making friends that caused Hermione to realize that she would be a lot more likable if she just dialed the bossiness back just a touch. It was simply after the troll fight that Hermione actually had the chance to show the lesson she had learned. Well, as far as plot advancement is concerned, this chapter accomplishes three major things. It tells us the rules of Quidditch, establishes Snape as a red herring villain since Harry and Ron noticed him towards the Forbidden Corridor, but by sheer chance didn't notice Quirrell also going there, and it causes Hermione to become friends with Harry and Ron, thereby forming what has been dubbed by fans as the Golden Trio. Each of these major plot advancements are, well, adequately handled. It's only Snape's red herring villainy that doesn't have major plot holes or terrible writing in it. For the other two, I've already discussed how I feel about each of them, but as far as advancing the story is concerned, they were... inadequate. Uh, aside from cameo appearances that aren't even worth mentioning, there's only really three characters in this chapter who actually do anything of note. Harry, Ron, and Hermione. As such, they're the only three characters who get any real character development this chapter. For Hermione fans, I hope you enjoyed the character development she underwent in this chapter, because for the entire rest of the series, that's all you're gonna get. 
From here on out, she is, as Rita Skeeter calls her during Order of the Phoenix, Little Miss Perfect. She knows the right balance between knowing when it's okay to break rules and when she needs to keep Harry and Ron in check. She overtakes Ron's role as the emotional support of the group. She even occasionally provides exposition for Harry, which is the only thing Ron is going to be good for from this point on, so why not just let him have that? And she's also constantly the center of attention with boys like Victor Crumb or Cormac McClacken. All in all, from this point on, Hermione Granger is just too flawless to be interesting. Harry's leadership was on full display in the last chapter, but it gets a few moments to shine through here. The most important moment is when he realizes that Hermione needs to be warned about the troll, and conscripts Ron to accompany him on this rescue mission. Sure, Ron came along willingly, but it was still Harry leading the charge. However, the real star of this chapter is Ron, who does the vast majority of stuff in this story. It's Ron who causes Hermione to realize that she's tucking her bossiness a little too far, and for a guy who couldn't figure out how to do the hovering charm earlier that same day, he comes through in a pinch and performs the hovering charm flawlessly, thereby taking out the troll all by himself. While he follows Harry's lead, he also didn't complain when Harry reminded him that Hermione needed to be warned. Sure, he doesn't like Hermione at the moment, but he doesn't complain for a minute when dragged into imminent danger. So we can add noble, heroic, and brave onto his list of character traits. Next time, Harry actually plays a game of Quidditch. Snape's status as a red herring villain gets explored more, and we also get a new clue as to what the three-headed dog is guarding. So, tune in next time when I do a retrospective and story analysis of Chapter 11, Quidditch. In the meantime, however, I am Acer Thorn, and I will see you guys later.